you have your Bibles, I'm going to read a portion of Scripture in the book of Proverbs. First, I would like to uh, tell you of a Scripture that Jesus gave. Matthew chapter 13, when he finished all of his parables, he said, uh, he said, a scribe that is instructed in the ways of the kingdom taketh out of his bag or out of his arsenal or out of his supply things both old and new. And tonight, I hope we are instructed in the way of the kingdom. We are going to reach into the bag and take out something old. In Proverbs chapter 13, I want to read one verse of Scripture to you, and that is verse number 15. The book of Psalms gives us a relationship with God. The book of Proverbs gives us a relationship with our fellow man and with life. And my text tonight is Proverbs 13 and 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. And now, just before you're seated, I would like for you to pray with me that God would touch us in a special way. God, I thank you. I love you. <coughs> I praise you. I believe you to move with your presence and spirit in our lives, in our hearts, in our souls. Let the Holy Ghost, dear God, touch us. Oh, God, we pray with your power and presence and spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody said, praise the Lord. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. Transgression is as old as the human race. Almost. Failure and sin in the human race has started with the very first man and woman that was ever created. And the history of the human race is, is a history of brokenness, of stooped shoulders, of heavy loads, and of people that have sobbed their way through life with the grief and the guilt that is brought about by transgression. Of course, transgression started in the universe before the human race, but tonight we will concern ourselves primarily with the human race and this problem of transgression. The reason that we have to preach about something like this may be at first a question in your mind. You may say, Brother Wilson, why would we even dwell on such as this? Why don't we dwell on other things that are more pleasant and the reason that we have to dwell on things like this is because there is a real enemy of our souls, a sinister being called the devil, who constantly tries to paint a picture of transgression as though it is a beautiful thing and as though it is an attractive thing. And he tries to paint a picture that the forbidden fruit of the garden is the best fruit and that God is cheating you. The devil is a philosopher of sorts. And uh, he espouses, he puts forth this philosophy that God is cheating you. Uh, that uh, Eve, he does not want you to know the good things that he knows. And that is the very argument he used. He said, Eve, if, if you eat of this, God knows that you'll become like him to know good and evil. And uh, if you will partake of this, that you're going to have all the good things that God's got. But God doesn't want you to have those good things. He is a God of no. He is a God of thou shall not. And you do not want to follow God. You want to follow the fulfillment of your own interest and lust as a human being. What he was really saying is, is put the will of God aside and put the will of yourself on the throne. I didn't get to everything I wanted to preach this morning. I, uh, and I'm not going to preach it tonight. But I do want to mention one thing. That throughout the ministry of Jesus, he... He constantly reiterated three things that we want to avoid. And one of those things was rebellion. And one of those things was resentment uh, and uh, or bitterness. And one of those things was independence. These three areas Jesus dealt with constantly in the Sermon on the Mount and in his parables. 
that inwardly, introspectively, uh, subjectively, in a human being, there is nothing that is more dangerous or more uh, fatal to the progress and to the happiness of a human being than for them to have rebellion against the plan of God, which is for their own benefit, or resentment or bitterness against God or fate, circumstances in life that are dealt with uh, to us by other people or by whatever happens to take place, providence if you please. And uh, then independence from the mind and will of God, which is what Satan used on Eve and that first and faithful fall in the Garden of Eden on that day. I have looked back in my mind. I cannot look back in the Bible and find all of this, but I have looked back in my mind and pictured and imagined what it must have been in this world before the fall of Adam and Eve. It must have been a, a place... I think that was far beyond anything that we have imagined to date. If we, if you and I tonight were to put into action our, our best imagination and try to jump back and tell what it was like, I don't think we could. I believe it was far better than what we have today. I believe that Adam was close to being like Jesus Christ himself because Jesus is called the second Adam. And uh, before he fell, I believe he had powers that are far beyond that what you and I think of. He had dominion, if you'll recall. In fact, the Bible says God gave him dominion over uh, the air, the fowls of the air. He gave him dominion over the, the, the fish of the sea. He gave him dominion over the animals of the earth. So much so that he even named them. Uh, he gave him dominion over everything in this world or earth cosmos that we know about. And I believe that there was tremendous power in him and in his wife Eve. Uh, I believe that they had a unity that was much easier than what we have in marriage today. I believe that the things that we struggle with in communication with one another, uh, the things that we have to be careful of... Uh, the things that we have to work hard on to make sure that we are in touch with one another. I believe there was a better communication. This is just my idea. This is just what I think. I can't prove all this. But uh, there are vestiges of truths in the Bible that reflect back and make us believe that these things uh, were this way. I believe they had a better communion with one another. I believe they knew each other in ways and perhaps even communicated with one another at times with speaking no words at all or even from distances perhaps, uh, in ways that we are not able or capable of doing today because of the fall of man. And ESP and all this stuff is an attempt by man to go to something that may be possible but is lost in the fall and cannot be gained back as long as man stays in rebellion and resentment and independence from God. And all of the things that men do today to get it back will never bring it back. But thank God we're on the road in Jesus' name as we have the Holy Ghost uh, to the kind of life that God wants human beings to have. Can you say amen? amen. And I think these people, Adam and Eve, I don't know what they looked like, but I don't believe they had any blemishes. I, uh, I don't know what she looked like, but I believe she was a beautiful person. Uh, Eve means the mother of all living. I don't know uh, what Adam was like, but I believe he was a perfect specimen of what a man ought to be and can be uh, physically and mentally and, and spiritually. All of this prior to the fall. Uh, they, had, they had a good life. Now, they did work. Some people think that before the fall they didn't work. So some people don't work now, but that's no justification. They did work before the fall. Men have always been made to work. Well, shall I preach about that a while? Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> That'd be a good subject to preach about for a while as men working. Listen, if you can't get a job, go pay somebody an hourly wage so you can work for them. Rather than not work. Have you heard that too many times or are you just uh, afraid I'm hitting you? Everybody believes that's good preaching, said amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That is good preaching, whether you did say amen or not. Amen. But, uh, but then the work was different. It was, it was almost all creative work rather than uh, distasteful work. Uh, the trees had to be pruned. That's creative. The, the garden had to be tended. That's creative. But 
but there were no weeds that you had to worry with. And uh, there were no pesticides necessary because there were no negative bugs and all this stuff. And they didn't have worms at each tree's up that you got to paint them white and shoot stuff on them and all this stuff all the time. And uh, I don't believe they had to weed uh, uh, their lawn or their garden or whatever they had there. Uh, it, was a, it was a different kind of work. It was work that's a joy to do. It was uh, positive things. Uh, and um, it was different with the animals. There was virtually no fear before the fall. They did not live a life that was always afraid, uh, that needed houses for protection at night. Uh, why do we need protection at night? Well, one thing is uh, we need it all the time, but, but at night it's dark and it gives the enemy a chance to come. And what is the enemy? Well, the enemy's people that want to break in your house uh, and that want to violate your person or steal your goods. Uh, but Adam and Eve didn't have any people like that back there to create that kind of fear. Another reason for building houses with walls and protection is that wild animals, if you live out far enough, could come in and uh, that they could they could get you and uh, and make you into their supper. But Adam and Eve didn't have any wild animals back there. Why, when they decided to go to bed at night, he could just say, come here, fuzzy. And uh, one of those big African lions could run up there and uh, put his big paws up on Adam's chest. And Adam could scratch his head and say, lay down there, fuzzy. And uh, and uh, he and his wife could use that lion for their pillow that night, that mane. They didn't have to worry about fleas in the mane because there wasn't no fleas. And uh, it was it was it was just uh, just so many little things uh, that we could not get to or even conjure up in our minds uh, that these people had uh, going for them. And uh, it was a tremendous world that they lived in. Uh, they had they had happiness. They had joy. And uh, I think that even after Adam and Eve had children, I think that they told uh, uh, their boys, Cain and Abel, what it was like in the garden uh, prior to the fall. I believe that they talked about it. I cannot imagine uh, those two boys growing up and not asking some questions uh, and, not, and not being aware of some things uh, and not noticing some of the habits of their parents that... that uh, or some of the things their parents wouldn't talk about, or some of the things their parents avoided, or, or areas that their parents never were allowed into. The Bible says at the entrance of the garden, an angel with a flaming sword was placed there. And I don't know if they could see that angel, and I don't know if they could see that flaming sword. But when they were cast out of the garden, those boys, as they grew up in later life, uh, uh, maybe uh, as boys were, were, were there and aware that when they went to that garden, they could never get in uh, for whatever reason. But there were things that I believe that these boys and their parents talked about. Uh, and uh, after they fell, the fall was a terrible thing. And after they fell, I think that they talked to their boys around the fire. And um, uh, their boys probably became aware at a very young age uh, uh, that their parents had never been born, which is a unique situation. Sometimes I think my kids have thought that I haven't been born, that I was hatched, and that I didn't know anything. But, but these kids, they finally grew up and they somehow undoubtedly discovered that mom and dad had never been born. Have you ever thought about that? And that they probably talked to them about it. And maybe they talked to mom and dad and said, uh, uh, what, what, is it, what is it like, dad, uh, to never be born? For you see, Adam did not grow up from a little boy, but he was created full grown. And, um, and uh, Eve... Uh, did not grow up from a little girl, but she was created out of the rib of Adam. And some people say that, that Adam provided the first parts for the world's first loudspeaker system, but I don't think that's correct. And I can tell some of you women really love that. Uh, but I don't believe that, and I think people that say that, uh, they ought to quit. That's right. And so, uh, he didn't take, he did not take the bone from which Eve was created, from Adam's head, that she should dominate him. That'll preach, Doc. Now, if I stopped right there, some of you got a little acid on that one. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's square it up a little bit. And he did not take the bone from Adam's foot that she should be trampled upon. 
That's right. That breach too. But he took it from his side that they may walk together and that she might be a helpmeet unto him. And uh, I think maybe those boys, when they talked to their dad and said, what's it like to be a little boy? They must have talked a lot. They had no newspapers. They had no radio. They had no electrical communications of any kind, nor no printed matter. They had nobody else to talk to. They had the whole earth to themselves. And uh, they must have sat around their campfire at night in the, in the center of their little cabin that they must have built to protect them. And um, uh, they, must have, they must have discussed these things. Mom, what's it like to be a rib? <laughs> I'm just ribbing you. <laughs> Oh, so weak. But anyway, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> and, and she must have thought, she must have talked to them and said, Oh, boys, let me tell you something. And I am sure that Adam and Eve got carried away in the euphoria of talking about what it was like in their early life. I'm sure they told those boys things that make you and my eyes get big if we could look back and tune in on that discussion. And uh, she probably talked about uh, what it was like, uh, uh, there, there was, there was no pain and no sickness and all of that. And I am sure that those boys, uh, talked to their, to their dad about what was it like, dad, when you first woke up and your eye, your eye, what are these things? Your eyelids, uh, uh, did you still feel the sand grainy the first time you opened them because they were made out of dirt or were they already flesh when you opened them? And what did it feel like for God to breathe into you? The Bible says God breathed into Adam and he became or he was made a living soul. God, what was, uh, uh, Adam, uh, dad, uh, what was it like when God woke you up off of the shore and, uh, and you stood up and looked around for the first time? Uh, and I do believe that happened. I don't, I do believe there are some things that evolved, but not man. And I still believe that old poem is true, that uh, those that believe evolution, uh, I, I, I haven't told this poem so long, I'll probably blow that too, but once he was an amoeba, amoeba, from beginning to begin, and then he was a tadpole with his tail tucked in, and then he was a monkey climbing in a tree, and now he's a professor with a PhD. I don't believe that we came from monkeys. Well, sometimes when I look at some of you, I wonder. But no, not really. Not really, not really. When you look at me, you may wonder that. But in fact, we are created in the image of God. And uh, the monkey business is what messed everybody up in the first place. The, uh, instead of walking with God according to his precepts. Am I ever going to get off this first story here or not? But... Uh, I think that Adam got carried away telling them boy stories. I believe that every night, almost, when they came home, they worked in the field all day long. Their, their brow was matted with sweat, and uh, they worked hard. And at the end of the day, those two boys were, were tired. They worked with their father. Uh, they must have tilled uh, the fields or cared for um, the animals or whatever, the domesticated animals. Uh, when they came in at night, as the sun was just dropping in the western sky, and twilight had come, and there was a certain uh, darkness that was coming upon the earth, uh, and a certain mist that was coming into the area. And in the distance, perhaps they could hear uh, the, uh, the the laughter of the jackals, and uh, the cry of the coyote, and the roar of the lion, and and a tremble uh, uh, may have went through them. And uh, as they stepped into the door, and latched the makeshift door behind them. And uh, Mama Eve has got a little fire going there uh, with a little hole in the roof that the smoke can uh, get out the best that they can get it out. And uh, she's got a little meal fixed there. And, and as they begin to eat their meal, perhaps uh, they relax a little bit. And when they get through, they have something to drink and wash the meal down with. Uh, and I don't think they probably had very uh, uh, elaborate furniture. I don't know what they had, but... But uh, perhaps they laid back on their mats and 
uh, maybe, uh, maybe one of the boys got a far away look in his eye and said, Hey, Dad, I've been thinking about what you told us last night after supper. said, Tell us a little bit more about what it was like uh, uh, back when you were uh, younger and, and give us a little more of the story. And old Adam, uh, would, uh, they would get that look in his eye that would, uh, that would remind them of yesteryear and he could vi- envision what it used to be like. And he would talk to them and say, Boys, uh, I can remember. And then off the story would go as he began to tell them about former days. Uh, and he began to tell them about perfect weather. And he began to tell them of incidences uh, uh, in his early life of perhaps naming the animals uh, and uh, many other things that must have took place. Uh, and uh, his communion with God and all that took place. Uh, and uh, somewhere in that story, those boys probably got caught up in it. Uh, and said, Mom, you tell some of the story now. And uh, Eve would probably reiterate, I don't know how long they were here before the fall. There's debate about that. But uh, it may have been days. It may have been years. I, I'm, I'm not even going to guess how long it was. I don't think it was a long time. I, I don't think that there was a, a lot of time that passed from the time they were created till the time that they fell. But there was enough time that they had a little bit of life uh, uh, lived in this world before the fall. And Perhaps she picks the story up and everybody's caught up in the rhapsody of the story and is listening uh, with rapt attention as the, uh, as they relate what happened. And maybe after they finish one story, one of the boys would lean back uh, and uh, maybe they're just 12, 11, 10 years old. Maybe they're older, younger, I don't know. But uh, maybe they would laugh and all of them laugh together at some incident that mom told. And then one of the boys would speak up and say, uh, uh, Mom, tell us some more. And she would continue to tell more of the story. And, and then maybe dad would add his part. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, when he got through, uh, they would all say, Oh, dad, tell us some more. And this probably went on night after night. And, uh, finally he would say, No, it's time to go to bed. And, uh, the next night, maybe it would happen again, day in and day out, uh, until finally they told stories that he, they had reiterated many times, uh, until finally maybe the boys, uh, uh, encourage them and notice that the stories always stop at the same juncture, that they did not go beyond a certain place. Uh, and as those boys grew older and their awareness of life became broadened uh, and they began to see things in a wider perspective, uh, maybe one night laying there on the mat, they said, uh, Mom and Dad, tell us a little bit more. And maybe Mom got carried away and went beyond what she'd went before and told about their romps through the garden together uh, and told about the joy and the euphoria of living in that world. Uh, and they said, tell some more. And uh, she said, okay, let me tell you about the trees. And they talked about the trees a while. And he said, tell some more. And she said, let me tell you about the tree of life that was in the garden because it was there. And let me tell you about this tree and that tree. And, and uh, she told it and they said, tell some more. And maybe Adam got into it. Uh, and finally, maybe they said, tell some more. And she came to the end and she thought a little bit and said, uh, well, that's all the trees there is, boys. And they said, oh, mom, isn't there any more trees you could tell us about? And, and, and they'd never went that far before. And the boys had never been that old before. And <clears throat> Adam clears his throat and stands up and they've never seen their dad like this. His eyes look like some of the coals in the dying fire. There is a violence in his eyes. There is a depth of passion and feeling in him. They can see the muscles of his body tense and a trembling beneath the skin. And they look closely and they find him agitated under deep emotion as they sit there and look at their dad in awe. They've never seen him just like this. They see their mom as she shrinks back on her little mat and as she tries to move out of the firelight to A different spirit than they've ever felt comes in that room. Uh, There is no peace in the place right now, but rather a terrible sense of fury and a terrible sense of disappointment. Uh, And they watch their dad as he looks at them with eyes that burn and pierce. Uh, And I don't know exactly what he must have said, but it must have went something like this. Uh, He said, and boys, that was the day that, that, that we partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they can tell, perhaps, that their dad does not want to talk about it anymore. But he rivets them. They are mesmerized by the look in his eye. And he looks at them and points his finger at them and says, Boys, let me tell you one thing that I don't want either of you to ever forget. I want you to know, if you forget everything else I ever told you, the way of the transgressor 
is hard. And there's a numbing silence in the little room that night. And they turn over and everyone turns their back to the fire. And the boys lay there looking at the edge of the curtain. And they think about what their dad has said. Don't you ever forget that the way of the transgressor is hard. But the Bible tells us, and this is a unique phrase. I've never forgot it when I read it years ago. It, it, is, it caught my attention and it left a mark on me. The Bible says, it uses this phrase, it says, in the process of time. And oh, you could preach about that for 30 minutes. In the process of time, Cain and Abel grew and they came to adulthood or young adulthood on their own. In the process of time, uh, the Bible lets us know that they became responsible for making sacrifices of their own. Their daddy undoubtedly told them how that these sacrifices had to be made. The example was apparently given to them by God telling them that leaves cannot cover you. That's man's attempt to cover without the shedding of blood. But the Bible says in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so God teaches them by the shedding of blood and He covers them with skins, which means something had to die for them to have a covering. It was one of the very first types in the Bible of the coming of Jesus Christ when the great Lamb would die, that our sins could be covered by Jesus Christ. Uh, and there uh, they learned apparently the lesson about sacrifices. Uh, the Bible says in the process of time Cain and Abel came to bring their sacrifices to the Lord. And when they brought them, uh, Cain brought one kind of sacrifice uh, and Abel brought the other kind of sacrifice. Uh, Abel brought a sacrifice that was the shedding of blood. He brought a lamb. He brought of his flock, the Bible tells us, for his sacrifice. Uh, and Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Uh, he did not bring a blood sacrifice. Uh, somewhere along the way, Cain did not get the message deep enough. Uh, he wanted a sacrifice that did not have blood. And blood and death represents repentance. Uh, he wanted the glory without the suffering. He wanted the life without the death. Uh, he wanted all of the grandeur without the rest of it that goes before it. Uh, he wanted the praise without the repentance. Uh, because if you look in the Bible, you will find that there were times that sacrifices uh, of, of things that grow were grown uh, could be brought by the nation of Israel. But they had to be brought only after there had been blood sacrifice. Uh, and so Cain, among other things, undoubtedly, that I don't even know, uh, he represents, however, one of the things he represents... Uh, is the people that want the praise without the repentance. Uh, those that want the glory without getting uh, the, the independence and the rebellion and the resentment out of the heart uh, against God. Uh, those that want to come to God and give Him all of the thanksgiving, but do not start back down the line. Those that want to smoke their cigarettes and drink their booze and carouse and party in immorality and live a life that's profligate in sin, uh, like the wayward boy that left the father's home and the inheritance, uh, and then still come and enjoy the blessings of God and say everything is okay. But it's not okay because there first has to be a sacrifice of dying out to self uh, and of repentance, and there is no escape or way around that. Uh, you may go places tonight where people will tell you something different than that. Uh, you may go places tonight where you can shake the preacher's hand and they'll smooth it all over like slime. And uh, rather than use mortar to build the bricks of your home, they'll use slime like they did to build the Tower of Babel. Everything's a substitute. Everything's a secondary. Ever, nothing comes uh, from the primary source of the will of God. Uh, and they never go straight towards the things that are right. Uh, and I want to tell you tonight, it doesn't matter what anybody tells you and I. There is no way to the glory of God except to the way of repentance and death to self. And somehow Cain misses that lesson and, uh, and he brings his offering. And uh, the Bible says that something happened. Cain, for the first God's fire comes down apparently and consumes Abel's offering. But uh, there is no fire that consumes Cain's offering. And uh, his offering is unacceptable. He has done something that's independent of God's direction. He has done something that's in rebellion against what his father taught him. And he, uh, uh, at that point, he hears something happen in his life. Uh, he hears, um, he hears in him the bursting explosion uh, of bitterness that comes into his life or resentment. Uh, and he resents the fact that God has accepted his brother, but has rejected himself. Uh, 
And uh, so he goes, I don't know how many days went by, but he goes with that, with that bitterness seething inside of him. With every beat of his heart, the hatred gets blacker and the rancor gets deeper. And this boy forgets the lessons of his father. And uh, and he forgets about the burning eyes that he saw that night. Uh, and somehow he, he launches out on a pathway of his own. And I am preaching to people tonight that's in the same condition. Uh, and this boy decides that he will go his way and do his thing. He builds his case that he has been treated unfairly. I said, Cain built his case to convince himself that he had a right to feel like he felt. God didn't build his case. Justice didn't build his case. But his independence and rebellion and resentment built his case. This boy, after a few days goes by, Resentment goes to bitterness, and bitterness eventually goes to murder. Some people never carry it out in the flesh, but they carry it out in the heart. And this boy finds his brother together with him. They are walking in the field. I believe the Bible, that's almost verbatim. And while they are walking, perhaps they come to a place where the pathway narrows. And Cain steps back and lets Abel step in front of him. And with the heavy cudgel that he has in his hand, uh, he sees his opportunity. And looking at the back of his baby brother's head he takes that club and brings it down with all the force of his hatred on his brother's skull his brother falls there into the dirt and his rich red blood runs out onto God's green earth and then Cain hears something that he uh, has heard uh, um, perhaps only one other time in his life Uh, he hears the voice of God speaking to him And first of all, the voice of God says to him, uh, just prior to this, he said, Cain, uh, he said, why don't you bring the right sacrifice? Uh, He said, don't you know that the implication is that if you don't bring the right sacrifice, don't you know that sin lieth at the door? That's what the Bible says. And sin, that word lieth, uh, means literally in the Hebrew writing, it means croucheth. Like a waiting tiger or a waiting panther to spring upon you. In other words, Cain, why don't you stop? And why don't you look at what you're doing? And why don't you look at where you're going? But he rejects that warning sign. He drives through that red light. And I do feel the Holy Ghost tonight in what I'm saying. Let's love the Lord again. And so, and so, again, for the second time in his life, Cain hears the voice of God. And God speaks to him. I don't know how it came thundering out of heaven. But he speaks to him and says, Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Abel is dead, lying on a path somewhere in the distance. And Cain looks back to God and he says, Am I my brother's keeper? It is a way to not lie. But it always leads to a lie. Because he goes ahead and says, I don't know where my brother is. And the sad thing about sin is that that's how it works. It always starts usually small. It starts with a thought. Or it starts with an evasion of truth. Or it starts with a triggering of a little temptation. And then it starts with playing with that in the mind. Cain didn't just lift that club and kill his brother on impulse. uh, But for years perhaps, uh, and at least for days, all for certain, uh, that thing must have seethed in him. uh, and grew in him. 
and became like a cancer that was taking up more of his health than the healthy cells were. That's how sin is. It comes into the life of a person so small. It comes so innocently. I have watched it come into the lives of people. Seemingly, they do not understand what road they're getting on when they turn uh, onto that freeway uh, of sin. Uh, And as they start out, they're going slow, and it doesn't look bad, but it gets deeper and broader and thicker until they're caught in it, uh, in in the web. I, I remember, and my mind goes back, this has been a long time ago, but I still remember watching uh, a, a, a bug fly into a, a moth fly into a large spider web one night. We were sitting outside, and uh, it was outside. I was holding revival, as I recall. I was only, I, I remember this, and this has been a long time ago. I was only about 19 years old, and uh, I was preaching a revival out in the country in my own home church. We were at the pastor's house, and we were setting out on a swing out on a, on a slab that had been poured to build a garage that I don't know if it ever did get built. And since then, that house has all been torn down, and those days are long gone, and yesterday's fires are today's ashes, and it'll never be that way again. But I remember looking as we were swinging there after church one night, and uh, I was thirsty because we'd preached hard and sweated, and it was summertime, and it was hot, and uh, it was late. It must have been 10.30, 11 o'clock at least, and, and uh, sitting there trying to recuperate a little bit. And uh, I remember turning around and looking behind the swing, and there, attached to something, was a was a big spider web. And I watched this this moth as uh, as this moth flew into that web. And at first, it didn't appear that the moth was too worried about it. I don't know how much brains moths got; they couldn't have much because they're not very big. But anyway, um, this moth uh, fluttered around a little bit. But I watched as the as, as it fluttered a little more, and. What it didn't realize is that every time it fluttered, it was sending signals. It was sending tremors back into the, the hole in the center uh, of that web over where the spider was. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I watched as the spider became alert and, and came to attention. And uh, it was picking this up through its tentacles that I have caught another victim. And that moth began to flutter to try to get out of that web. And uh, after a little while, he got in just a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. And uh, I was, I was, uh, I wasn't hypnotized, but uh, maybe I wasn't far from it. Watching this scenario and thinking about how this worked uh, and how that this spider had had lured uh, this moth into this in this situation, had caught him without the moth being aware of what was happening. Uh, and then after the moth was caught in a little bit, I thought that moth may yet get out if it keeps struggling and kicking to get out, but. Uh, before it could get out, I watched, it was a big spider, and, and I watched that big old spider uh, uh, run across that web uh, and go to that moth and attack that moth. Uh, and I watched that spider, I, I guess it bit it, I don't know, I couldn't see that close, you know, and then old glasses on to see what, how, what all was going on down there. But, um, but I did see that spider as it took that moth, and it got it in its front, whatever those things are. And, um, and it began to make more web. And I watched it as that, even as the moth struggled, uh, it wrapped, it, it made new web and wrapped that web around that moth, uh, uh this way, uh, horizontally. And, and then after it got it wrapped that way, the moth was still struggling, but less and less. Then it turned that moth around and it began to wrap it the other way. And, uh, that moth could not get away. And while I was watching that, it impressed me deeply. And I thought, God, this is the way that sin does a young person or even one that's not so young. It takes them (laughs) and it looks uh, so innocent at first. uh, And it looks so insignificant at first. uh, And it looks like I just want to do my thing. I just want to try my wings. uh, I just want to, I just want to get out in the world and do what I want to do, not knowing that all of that is part of a lure that gets them in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And here is Cain with blood on his hands and finally he lies to God and uh, he became the first, uh, uh, murderer and, uh, there lies his brother in matted and dried blood and stiffened body 
And he looks to God and says, I don't know where he's at. Uh, And God brings judgment on him. The bad thing about judgment is it doesn't always just end right there. But the judgment was the beginning of what was happening to the life of that boy. When the judgment came on him, he had to live with judgment on him. I do not know if what I'm saying is completely true. But I know David Wilkerson just resigned from the Assemblies of God. And uh, some of my friends went and talked to him. And I don't know what he's going to do in the future. He's got a church on Times Square and all of that. Uh, But he said, one of the reasons I resigned is because the judgment of God is on that denomination. And he said, I want to get out of there because I don't want to be living where God's judgment is. The bad thing about it is, is the judgment of God came on this boy Cain. And Cain, when he felt the load of that thing fall upon him, he did not know how hard that was going to be when he started down that road. He did not know how heavy that load was going to be when he started out. And he looks back to God and he screams and he says, God, my load, my punishment is greater than I can bear. That's in the Bible. He said that. My punishment is greater than I can bear. And God spoke back to him. He was banished. The Bible says that he was sent into the land of Nod. The land of Nod. Nod in that word doesn't mean sleep. It means the land of wanderings. It means from that point forward, Cain became a vagabond. Cain became a wanderer. Cain was a nomad. Cain was a man without a home. Cain was a man who could never get it together. He became fiddle-footed, if you please. He could never find a stable place to bite in and anchor down and make a success in his life. And he became a wanderer and a vagabond. And everywhere he went, he was separated from God's presence. And he could not find a place of peace. And it all started so small. Cain, why didn't you remember? Perhaps at this point, as Cain leaves the presence of God, perhaps he stops on the trail and sees an imaginary scene of his old dad standing there several years before and looking at him with eyes that look like embers of the fire and and, and that penetrate his very brain. And he can hear those words of years gone by roll back that says, Boys, if you forget everything else I ever told you, don't you forget that the way of the transgressor is hard. And now, now he's gone too far and he's into an era of judgment in his life and he can't get himself out. I don't know. I just don't know tonight how far to take this. I remember... Richie Hamilton. Richie Hamilton was a buddy of mine. I got the Holy Ghost. And I prayed his wife. uh, I'm sorry, not his wife. This was before he was married. I prayed his mother through to the Holy Ghost. I was there when she got the Holy Ghost. And um, if I recall in a revival, I was preaching there at home. And um, it was a miracle that she even got saved. But she did. Lived for God till the day she died. She's passed on now. I look forward to seeing her someday. My old fellow cotton chopper. I'd go out with those old ladies and chop cotton, and every one of them could out-chop me, thank God. Because if they couldn't have, I may still be doing it. But anyway. Um, but um, I'd talk to Richie. We called him Richie. I'd talk to him. We, we, were, we were about equals physically and, and athletically and so forth. And it, was always, it was always a hot competition when we were against each other in anything. And uh, when it came to high school, I got the Holy Ghost, and of course the Holy Ghost doesn't play high school athletics, and so I didn't play because I wanted to keep the Holy Ghost. And Richie played, became a star on the team. Uh, He became, he got, I don't know how many awards uh, for being a top defensive lineman. And uh, time went by, and, and I'd talk to Richie every once in a while, and I'd say, Richie, uh, you need to get right with God. He knew. He knew about Pentecost. The other kids in school just knew that I had changed, but they couldn't figure out what happened to this guy. They, some of them thought I lost my rocker, and, and uh, some of them, some of them they, they just respected but feared at the 
the same time, uh, which wasn't all bad, but he understood. And I'd talk to him, and I'd say, Richie, you know, you need to get right with God. And uh, he'd say, yeah, he'd, he'd never argue with me. He'd say, yeah, you're right, Nate. He said, I really need to. I need to do something about that. I, I need to. But he didn't. He didn't do anything. And, and time went on. He is unsaved tonight. And now it's unbelievable that I am 42 years old. And here is this kid that I ran around with 25 years ago. And, and, uh, and he still doesn't know the Lord. Uh, and uh, a few years later, he was dragging uh, on Main Street. And he got in a drag race uh, with another fellow and ran into an intersection and killed a woman and her three kids and, and uh, ended up on the front page in prison for manslaughter. And that's where he belonged uh, uh, for such a, a stupid stunt. Uh, but, uh, but all of his life from that point uh, became alcoholism and became, uh, <laughs> became drugs and, and became uh, immorality and became jail, became, I don't know how else to describe it, except a total low life. When sin gets through, it doesn't have anything left for you. It'll cast you aside like an old shoe. I was preaching a revival a number of years ago in a church that was right across the street from a railroad tracks. A man came into the Sunday night service and sat down in the back. At the end of the service, I went back and talked to him. And I said, I said to him, I said, why don't you... Why don't you let the Lord touch your life? And uh, He didn't respond. He turned around and walked out the door. He was a bum off the railroad track. He went out the door, and I went back to the pulpit. And so but when I got back, I saw him go out, so I went out the side door around the side of the building. And I caught him out there. Just as I walked up, he was reaching in his back pocket and pulling a, a bottle of something, alcohol, out of his liquor, out of his pocket. And uh, he was taking a drink of it. And, and I, said, uh, I said, what's your name? And uh, he is a nameless man tonight in my mind. I cannot remember his name. He said, I lost my wife about 10 years ago. And he said, when my wife died, I just became a slave to the bottle. And he said, preacher, I do not have one single friend in the world. Not one. And he said, I'm only sober two or three days a month. And I talked to him. I said, why don't you, why don't you give God uh, a chance in your life? He said, yeah, I know, preacher. But he said, I'm, I'm, I'm just far gone. And he said, I, I'm, I'm in so deep. I'm in so deep. It, it, it was something that touched my heart. I was from a little country town. I can remember the first time I ever went to the second largest skid row in America on a street service with some Bible school kids. I remember stepping onto that street corner. It's as vivid in my mind as though it was last week. I remember seeing the masses of humanity in that large city that 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 turned that corner and 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 walking there and stumbling and people falling into the gutter. I remember seeing the broken and wasted and lost humanity and in my mind I can still remember I made it through that service. My heart was so deeply touched. I was 17 years old. My heart was so deeply touched. There was I cannot describe to you the compassion that went out of me uh, to those people. Uh, and I remember getting back on the bus to go to the church. And a few of them got on. And I don't remember who they were or anything about them. I just know that I was in another world. I remember sitting down in the seat of that bus against the window. Uh, and there something took place. Uh, uh, I began sobbing and weeping. I had never seen broken humanity like that. Uh, it did something to me. I hate the devil. I hate what he does. I hate his imps. And I hate his untiring efforts to destroy people. And I hate what I see him doing in the lives of people. And it disturbs me deeply. And there is that within me that wants to fly off the handle and quickly smash him. But I realize that it's an extended warfare and that I've got to keep coming back every Sunday morning and hit it again. And every Sunday night, Brother Barry, and hit it again. And every Wednesday night, it's going to take more than one punch. It's going to take more than a burst of fury. I have to stay at it day in and day out and be careful that while I'm helping others, I myself don't get destroyed because I know we're against a vicious and a nasty and a dirty enemy that doesn't care how he fights, but he wants to to destroy and grind to powder. And it 
You forget everything else I preach. Don't you forget, if you get on the road, and some of you are on it tonight, the way of the transgressor is hard. Let's ask God to help us again. Hallelujah. 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 And now that I've been preaching for a few years, I can look back and see the lives that Satan and sin has destroyed in, by transgression. I remember, I remember Lonnie. Lonnie used to pastor an apostolic church, UPC Church in Kansas. When I preached the revival, Lonnie was backslid. He was older than I was. Him and his wife both used to sing, good singers. And they backslid. He came to that revival and prayed through while he was so drunk he didn't hardly know where he was. Prayed through, began to speak in tongues, drunk as a hoodow. But he prayed. We went over to his house, the pastor and I. I can remember, I can remember Lonnie having... The DTs. He was so, so wrapped up in alcohol. I can remember his his dry heaves. I can remember sitting there uh, by the hour in that, in that, in that destitute, trashy little apartment complex. I can remember sitting there and 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 listen to him as he moaned. We poured all the whiskey down the drain. I can remember him shaking so bad. We went in and and uh, he 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 wanted us to rub his back and say he'd say just sit down on top of me and rub my back. And I can remember us sitting down on top of him on on the bed and rubbing his back and uh, and trying to help him through this time some way. But and and he did. He prayed and and his kids came in for a while, but his kids didn't last. And they came in again. And they didn't last. And they got a lot. Oh, the talented kids, but they didn't last. They're grown men now, and they're back out again. And, and, and Lonnie didn't last. What I didn't realize at that point, I think I did realize it, but wasn't positive that it was too late, is that, is that Lonnie had not just hit the net. Lonnie had not just hit the web. But Lonnie was already in the grass being turned one way and then the other. Tonight, as far as I know, he still lives in that town. He is still lost. He is still away from God. Oh, that I would never, ever, ever allow anything to get in my life that would cause me to miss the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Uh, regardless of what I do or don't accomplish in life, God, let me walk softly. Let me walk carefully. Don't let me worry about who's done good or bad to me, with me, or, or about me. But let me somehow remember that the way of the transgressor is hard. And let your spirit, God, continue to rest upon my life some way. If nothing else, God, if nothing else, oh God, I've got to be saved. Let's love Him again. Saul was this kind of man. Saul was a man that had many opportunities, and yet he walked the way of the transgressor. Somehow he didn't respect the word of Samuel. Somehow he did not respect the word of the Lord. Somehow he let peer pressure and problems of people make him not listen to the word of God. And, and he took the sheep and he took the bullocks back and and uh, when he brought him back to meet Samuel, Samuel told him to slay utterly, slay everything, uh, kill it all. And, and, and Saul did not do it. He brought back those sheep and those cattle and he brought back the king. But he killed everything else. He killed almost everything. And there's a lot of preaching in that. He almost killed everything, but he left a few things. And he brought them back. And when Samuel got there, he said, Have you done what the Lord told you to do, Saul? And Saul said, Oh, yes, Samuel, I've done what the Lord told me to do. And Saul 
Saul looked at him and, and, and affirmed that he had done it. And Samuel looked back to him and said, Then Saul, what is this I hear? The bleeding of sheep and the lowing of cattle. And Saul said, The people made me do it. Oh, what a shabby excuse. It's other people's fault that I'm a transgressor. But it's not. Don't you ever... Forget it. It'll never stand up in the great justice court of eternity. And Samuel takes the sword and he says, God told you to utterly slay. And he lays fat Agag down and puts his foot on his neck and brings that sword down and severs his head. And, and, and it's a type to you and I of what has to be done with sin in a person's life. But that's just one of many times with Saul. His whole record in the Bible. He was head and shoulders above everybody. He was the best looking of the bunch. He was the strongest of the bunch. He won every arm wrestling contest. Uh, he won every uh, contest of agility and athletic ability. Uh, he won everything. He won the hearts of all the girls. Uh, he had everything going for him. He had the touch of God that called him because he was head and shoulders uh, above everybody. He even had humility in the early part of his life. But some where all that went along the way and he decided to do what he wanted to do. Amen. Until finally we find him on the way to the witch of Endor because he cannot hear from God anymore. And it will happen to you. It will happen to you, I say tonight, that if you continue to walk away of transgression, it finally comes to the place that you'll justify doing the very things that God said destroy people for doing. Now on the way to the witch of Endor, a miserable man, a nerve-wracked man, a man who's had nervous breakdown after nervous breakdown, a man whose, whose sanity is in, in danger of being totally lost, holding on by a thin thread, uh, shaking every day when he gets up. Uh, music can't resolve the problem anymore. Nothing can resolve the problem anymore. He's on the way to the witch of Endor, and at night as he travels incognito, so nobody will know what's going on, uh, he looks up at the sky and the stars. The, they don't they don't reflect warmth anymore. It, it's not an awesome, uh, beautiful thing, but rather they look like stainless steel spikes driven into the vault of a cold and unhearing heaven because he can't hear from God. And as he goes along, the whirring of the spokes is not a comforting sound, but as it hits through. Uh, the grass on the edge of the road, uh, the whirring of the spokes of his chariot seem as every time they revolve to say, Saul, the way of the transgressor is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. Until finally he wants to say, stop, don't tell me that again. But he cannot get away. So finally he drives up into the yard of the witch of Endor and there... Something that is an exception to the rule in the Old Testament. The spirit of Samuel comes up and God allows him to come up to speak to Saul. And, uh, and this, this witch was shocked that it happened because she's used to getting other spirits. But God allowed Samuel to come up. And this witch was totally freaked out. Didn't know how to handle it at all. Totally beyond the scope of her seance uh, and, and of her ability in, in that realm of demonic uh, uh, communication. Uh, and Samuel speaks to Saul and says, you'll be with me this day, this time tomorrow. Saul knows he's going to the battlefield the next morning. He doesn't sleep much that night. Uh, he is a rugged man. Uh, he is a great man. Uh, as I look at his shoulders standing in that ragged hut of a woman that he was supposed to throw out of Israel because she was a witch. Uh, and, and now he ends up going to her to get advice. Uh, and I look at him from the back and he doesn't know I'm looking at him. Uh, and I see his hair uh, thick hair on the back of his head uh, and, and brawny shoulders that now are slumped uh, uh, as a sh slight sign of the weariness uh, of, of a great man or a gone awry. Uh, and there he stands until even judgment pronounced can hardly touch him. He is in a, he is in a, he is in a benumbed state mentally that he hardly knows where he's at. He doesn't sleep, but rather he eats a big meal that the woman fixes. Uh, and the next morning as the sun comes up, he makes his way back to the battlefield. Uh, and he goes out onto that battlefield to fight. Uh, 
And on that particular day, uh, there is someone that draws a bow at a venture, uh, and it is shot, and it hits Saul, uh, and down he goes. Uh, and there on the battlefield, Israel runs, the Bible says. Uh, they flee away uh, as they are defeated, uh, and the dead are left there, and Saul is one of them that is left laying on the battlefield dead. And I can see them as the Bible says they come. The soldiers of the enemy camp. As they come through in victory. The spoils always go to the victor. And they go through the battlefield. Laughing and cussing. Vulgar men. Strong. Rough. Mean. They go through the field. Spitting here and trampling there. Turning over the body of the dead. Picking up here a helmet. And there a pair of shoes stripped off of someone. Here a sword and there a shield. And here a piece of armor. And as they go across the field yelling to one another and showing them what they've got. Finally somebody comes upon an abnormally large man. And as they look and see him, they are struck with awe as it dawns on them that the famed Saul that everybody knows is laying there before his eyes with his unseen, unseen eyes opened up to heaven and skimmed over with death. And they look and see his mouth opened and the muscles contorting into rigor mortis. And they, it dawns on him, the king has been gone. The king is dead. We got the king and didn't know that we got the king. And that's what some of them are waiting to do to some of you boys tonight that are not walking with the Lord at this present time. And some of you that are not boys. And this soldier yells and others run across the field and come to the place where the fallen Saul is and said, here's the king, here's the king. And the Bible says they go there while they're stripping the slain and they strip his armor off of him. Let me tell you, before it's done, Peter, the Lord speaks to Peter and says, Peter, I have prayed for you, for Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. You know what that tells me? That tells me Satan is not satisfied just to have you in his hands. Satan is not satisfied just for you to go to hell. But Satan is a destroyer. It's in his nature. It's in his gut, if you please. He wants to destroy. He is vicious. He is beyond redemption. He doesn't just want you dead, Saul. He's going to strip you now that he's got you dead. And his imps, these soldiers, come and they begin to pull the armor off of him. They're amazed as they laugh and hold up the gigantic helmet on that big head and they take off that armor that was on those brawny soldiers. They almost look in awe at this one that has fallen and they say, oh, look what we found as they strip the boots off of him. And I don't want to embarrass you in mixed company tonight, but they go beyond that. They strip all the armor off and then they start on the clothes and they strip all all of his clothes off and somebody takes that big body and they cut his head off and they take him and they lift that heavy body maybe three or four hundred pounds I don't know all I know is that there wasn't an ounce of fat on it that didn't belong there and they take him and they take his head and they go to the walls of Jezreel as I recall and there on the wall of that city they take his body and they put it up there laughing with glee and they nail spikes in and nail his body to the wall and now people look at him in his in his Total, 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 total dissolution. They look and see this man. Not only is he dead, but he's stripped of everything. He's stripped of everything. Hear me tonight. I'm telling some of you that you're on that road. Some of you ought to know better you're on that road. And you're blaming everybody and you're blaming everything. But God doesn't hear it. You've got to understand that the way of the transgressor is hard. And the only hope is to return to God. And some of you have gone far enough. You're not going to be able to return. Turn to God one time and repent and everything going to be all right. You've gone too far for that uh, because the bitterness is going to rise back up the next morning and you're going to have to fight it down again. And the bitterness is going to rise back up again and you're going to have to fight. It's going to take many days. It's going to take months. Uh, it's already deep into the cocoon of the spider that you have fallen uh, and you don't understand how bad it's going to get. 
I promise you that God is speaking to hearts in this place tonight. Let's love Him again. For I have called you, and I question you why you are not responding to my call, for you have not responded to my call. And I reach for you, and you shy away, and you will not allow me to touch you. Think you that there is another avenue of escape or another way? Had there been another way, thank you that I would have come to Calvary to make a way. For yea, I say there is no other way except humility and following the word which my servant proclaims to you. For I have anointed and I have given unction and I have brought my word to you. Thank you not that I love you because my love is still extended tonight. If I did not love, would I not warn and would I not reach for and would I not plead with you to respond to the touch and to the glory of my spirit? Yea, I have spoken and I will speak, but I am calling to you because I love you. But sternly I say to you, to repent and turn to me and feel and know my love, for there is no other way nor avenue of escape. Had there been, I would not have come, but I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the light and life, and there is none besides me. Hear the word of the Lord. Let's love Him again. Let's lift our hands and love Him again. Let's pray. I was trying to think back. It has probably been, you know, after you live a while, you that are, have been around a while realize that you can look back and get a perspective that you can't get till you live. You, there's no way to, other way to get it. You can read, but it's not as real. I was trying to think how long ago it was. It must have been in uh, late 1960s. I was preaching a revival in a garage in an alley in a little town that there during the days of Wyatt Earp there couldn't have been any that's much wilder than this town. It was wild right here in the San Joaquin Valley. In fact, I'd preached a revival in that place before in a bar room. And they paid me for it, $26 a week. That was the best I think I got. And I slept in the back of the bar room. They had church in the front of it, dirty old place, walls caving in. You wouldn't believe it. But I stayed there and preached. And then I went back there a year or so later and preached this revival. Sister Wilson and I, we were married the second time, and we slept on the floor on a mattress in the pastor's home. That's all he had. This is no exaggeration. We didn't have anything to eat. The pastor didn't have anything to eat either. He and I went out one afternoon and shot a pheasant. 
Uh, he shot it. I didn't shoot it. He hit it. And then hit it. H-I-T and H-I-D. It wasn't pheasant season. And he shot it with 22. But our hunger drove us to transgress. I guess. He took it back behind the church and cleaned it. And um, took it home. He said, here's supper. It's a true story. His wife didn't know how to cook. Young couple. So Sister Wilson, the, we said, here, cut this, cut this meat up. It's like chicken. So she cut the pheasant up and fried it. We sat in the house with virtually no furniture. Sleeping on a mattress, the bedroom with no furniture, and ate that pheasant that day, and preached in the garage behind the house in the alley at night. The garage was about twenty by twenty-five. Country people. I remember one night it was packed out. Didn't really take many people to pack out the two-car garage. But it was packed out. We had electric guitars and everything going, boy. Now, I remember that night when I preached, I made an altar call, and a young boy came to the altar. <clears throat> he didn't have on a shirt yet. I think he had a little skimpy part of a T-shirt on. And um, he didn't have on his shoes. He's barefooted. He had on an old pair of jeans, and he had a rope for a belt about 15 years old his name was Steve he came to the altar that night had his had a burr haircut I mean just burr everything and um, and he repented prayed with him friendly kid he later we found out that his folks were very prominent people in Fresno California and um, that he was from a well-to-do home. Well, the boy, after he repented, he didn't live out there in this little town where we were preaching. He, I don't know what he's doing out there. He was just wandering around. A lot of people wandered around in the 60s. He's one of them. Little Waggy's one of them. And um, while he's wandering around out there, he wandered into the alley and wandered into that church wandered into the altar and repented of his sin. Word of God touched his heart. <clears throat> the revival was over. I didn't know what happened to the boy until a few months later I was talking to Brother Morton. He said, yeah, the, the boy um, has come to Fresno. Maybe it was several years later. I don't know. And uh, back where his folks live. And he said he'd come to my church and got the Holy Ghost. And um, we baptized him in Jesus' name. I said, he's in your church? He said, yeah. He said, he don't listen very good, but he's in the church. He's, 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 he's independent as he can be, and he, he doesn't understand the importance of heeding what I'm preaching and telling him, but he's coming, and he does love God. So time went on, and I think he left Brother Morton's. He went up to Oregon. Didn't listen to anybody and uh, just rebelled. But he, he loved God. But, you know, sometimes you can love God and have things in you that's going to destroy you. And um, he came back from Oregon, back to Fresno, went over to San Jose for a while, didn't last there, bounced back to Fresno again. Finally left there and went down to Houston to Bible school. And while the choir was singing, I leaned over to Brother Burnett, who was teaching in Texas Bible College at that time, and I said, do you remember a boy named Steve? I described him, and he said, yes, I remember him. This boy wouldn't listen. He did not listen. He was, he was, a, he was a transgressor. When he went to Bible school, these patterns had been deeply ingrained in him, and he, he just kept on doing his thing. 
they had, of course, they had rules at the school, and uh, he would break these rules. They had rules about going out on weekends, to going out of town, leaving the campus, and frequently he would break these rules and go out, do his thing. And I don't know if he'd have went to hell for if they said don't go down to Foster's Freeze and get a Frosty on Saturday, and he went and got one. I don't know if he'd go to hell for that. But I do know that he was setting patterns that was leading him down the wrong road. And I do know that down the line, these things do have a way of catching up with you. And this boy persisted. And finally, one weekend, they said, uh, we don't want anybody leaving campus this weekend. And him <clears throat> him and his buddy named Rick, Rick got the Holy Ghost about the same time as this boy was coming to the altar. Uh, well, Rick got it a couple of years before, I guess. And uh, they were both out of Fresno, and they both went to Bible school in Houston. And that particular weekend that they said, don't go anywhere, they jumped in their little car. And, as I remember he had a little Volkswagen bug. This had been years after the first time he'd come to the altar. And he drove from Houston to San Antonio. And just outside of San Antonio, there is a place that is called Jacob's Well. It is a world-famous place for deep-sea diving. Um, and... Um, they went there with, with their equipment to deep sea dive. It's actually not in the sea. It's, uh, it's in San Antonio. But, but they feel like, they think that somewhere down, down way, way down in the earth there's some subterranean passage in which this thing may be connected to a water channel that may lead out to the sea. It's, it's a very unique situation. And uh, <clears throat> so they put their stuff on and they... They jumped in. It's not very big. As I understand, the hole to get in is probably not as big as this platform. And uh, when you go down, there, there's, no, there's no side passages. It just goes straight down. And um, there is, in this, in this thing called Jacob's Well, there are four chambers, four rooms down there underwater. And um, they jumped into this thing, and they began to go down in here. And everything they were doing was against what they had been told to do. And uh, I can still remember Steve with a goofy grin on his face as he came to the altar that night. He had the goofiest grin, like he was half, you know, just half there. But he was very, very intelligent. And um, I can still remember him praying in that goofy way, with his head kind of cocked back and all that. And uh, they went down in the first hole. They swam around in there for a while, looked around with their equipment on and their, their uh, bottles of oxygen on their back. And uh, it was about 20 feet deep or so in the first hole, maybe 25. And then they went to the second hole. And uh, these holes, as each one went deeper, of course, it got darker. And as it got darker, of course, it became more treacherous and uh, more foreboding to keep going. And the experienced divers would go down into the second hole, which uh, the bottom of that was 50 or 60 feet below the surface, which was getting on down there. And then at the bottom of each hole, there was a there was a relatively large opening. By relatively large, I mean a, a body could easily get through it into the next room or next hole. And as they proceeded to go down in this, the experienced divers went into the third hole. Um, uh, other people went into the first hole and some into the second. But the third hole was way down. bottom of the third hole was about 90 feet deep. And then beneath the third hole, there was a fourth hole. Uh, and nobody ever went into the fourth hole because the fourth hole was so far down and was so treacherous, and nobody knew what kind of currents may be way down in there. And the entryway into the fourth hole was only about so big around to get in, maybe even smaller, that was all. And, um, and of course, wise divers would not go in there because they didn't know, number one, what was there. They didn't know it was dark as pitch. They had little lights on their their deals but um, there was no way to see down there it wasn't like being in a lake that that the sun's shining on on 50,000 acres of water or something it was just deep and dark and and so they went down in the first hole <clears throat> fooled around and went down in the second hole fooled around some more and uh, finally uh, they they talked about it and he said let's go back down to the second hole again and let's go down to the bottom of it and see if we can get into the third hole and see what it looks like. And uh, Rick said, I, I don't want to go. He said, let's, I'll go to the second hole with you, but I don't want to go any further. And so they went down <clears throat> in the second hole. And uh, 
When they got down to the bottom of it, Steve was leading. And, uh, you know, sometimes people lead that shouldn't be leading. They, they, they'll, they'll lead you to hell. Uh, you, you don't want to just follow somebody because they act like they know what they're doing. You want to make sure you're following the righteous. You want to make sure you're following good counsel. Uh, because uh, somebody can lead you into an area that you cannot you cannot escape from. And so Steve led Rick down to the bottom of the second hole. And when they got there, he turned around and tapped Rick, and, and he signaled. He said, let's go on down to the third hole. And um, and Rick said, I don't want to go. And, he, and they, they had a little talk uh, with their hands and said, come on, let's go. And they went down into uh, the third hole. And uh, when they got in there, <clears throat> it was dark it was uh, scary it was foreboding and they uh, swam around a little bit and and they kept going deeper and uh, Rick could reach out and touch um, uh, Steve's ankle and they would they would go deeper and they'd go deeper and finally they got down well however far it is the bottom of the third hole 90 or 100 feet or so and uh, they were way down there it was pitch black and when they got to the bottom <clears throat> Steve turned around to uh, Rick and he said, he said uh, with hand signals, he said, let's go down into the, the, the fourth hole. And, um, and Rick went like this. No, I'm not going in there. And uh, Steve, Steve tried to talk him into it. Let's go in there. And uh, Rick gave him a hand signal and said, I'm not going in there. And uh, Rick began to get scared because Steve had more guts than he had brains. And uh, he was used to doing his own thing. He was used to just going on against the advice of everybody. That was the pattern of his life, like some of you. And so he went down to the bottom of the third hole. And when he got to the bottom of the third hole, um, he, he, said, he made a signal. He said, I'm going on down. They went on down beyond the rope. They had a rope they could get out, but they... They went beyond the rope. They were breaking all the rules. They were, they were going beyond all the safety precautions. They were going beyond all the advice in the booklets of how to do all this. They went, just kept on going. Just don't listen to anybody. Just I'm doing my thing. I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me. I don't need you. I know more than you do. And all of this, that was the pattern of his life. And, and, so, um, and so Rick waited there <clears throat> as Steve had to take his bottles off. Uh, this place I'm telling you about is, it's there. You could go there today. In fact, uh, a couple years after this happened, I read in the Reader's Digest about this place as it described it. A few years ago, you may have read about it. And uh, you can't go into the fourth hole anymore. They went down there with, with uh, rebar, and they put rebar over that opening, and they took cement down there and sacked cement and, and plugged that up so nobody can get in there. But this was a few years ago. This was before they did that. And, um, and uh, so... So uh, Steve could not squeeze in there, so he took his bottles off. And, and um, the, the, the signal, of course, if you need help, is to tap on your bottles. But he took them off and moved them around in front of him some way while he was getting in there. And, and uh, that, that hole was small, and he, and he took his bottles and put them out ahead of him into that dark place. And then he, he put his head down and slowly wormed his way in there. Rick didn't want him to go. Rick said, don't, don't go in there. Stay out of that place. You don't, that, that's not what you need to do. And he tried to get him to come on back up. But he insisted on doing his thing. And so he, he wormed his way in there until all Rick could see was just the white on the bottom of his heels. And then Rick could not see anything. And, um, and Rick said after he got in there, he said, I don't have any idea what happened. But he said, I know his light went out and there was no light and it was pitch black in there. And he said, all I can tell you is that I heard him start giving the frantic signal to help me. And that was beating on his tank. And Rick said, I could hear him beating on his tank frantically for help. Rick said, I don't know what happened in there. But I remember him beating on his tank. And he could remember him beating on that tank. And he said the beating got weaker and slower and weaker and slower. And he said finally it stopped. He said I was panic struck. Rick turned 
swam back to the where the rope was, followed the rope to the surface, got out, told some other guys that were there what had happened. And he said, my buddy's down there. And he went into the fourth hole. Everybody panicked. They went, to the, they went nearby to get divers. And, and by this time, Steve was dead. They went to get divers to go down to get his body. And uh, they got some local divers there. And they went out there and they said, where's he at? And they said, he's down there. And they said, which hole's he in? They said, he's in the fourth one. And the divers stopped. They said, we won't go. They said, we're not going down there. We're not going in the fourth hole. They wouldn't go after him. Finally, they got the top divers in America. It took hours, of course. And finally, two or three of the top divers in America came over there. And, um, and even they were afraid to go down there. They said, this is, this is, we don't want to do this. But we will make one trip down there. And we will see if we can reach in there and find his body in that fourth hole. They went down the rope and extended it all the way down to the bottom. They said these divers were something. Said those young men were standing there. And, uh, and a, a couple of them, and they had their girlfriends with them, and they, they were watching their, their boyfriends as they went down in there, strong young men, to, to try to rescue this boy, and said it was highly tense as they, as they jumped into the water, and, and they started down, swimming downward through room one, and through room two, and through room three, until they got down to the bottom of the third floor, and and the young diver that went in there with all of the trappings so that he would not get caught, he just barely stuck himself through there a little bit and reached out into that place. And when he reached out, he, could, he felt Steve's body in the blackness and the darkness. He could feel it in there. And, uh, and when he felt his body, he pulled the body towards him. And he wrapped a rope around that body and tied it around the waist. And then... He turned, or the foot, I don't remember which he tied, but I do know that he turned and, and worked his way back out of there. And he went back, and both of those boys went back to the surface. And he explained what he'd done. He said, I've tied that body onto that rope. And he said, I, uh, I don't know how you're going to get it out, but you're just going to have to get it out. And so they started pulling, and the body got stuck in the hole, and they couldn't get it through because of the way, uh, the, the form of the body. And they said, you're, you're going to have to go back down there and, and uh, help get it through. And that boy looked at them, the crack diver in America. And he said, I want to tell you something. If you get him out, you're going to pull him through that hole because I will not go back down there again. There are some places that the wise will not go. They may go to help somebody a few times, but you're not going to get them to keep doing that because they know how valuable their life is and how terrible death can be. And so they pulled that boy's body out of there. They pulled it. They got a hold of that rope and they pulled Steve that had come to the altar in that garage in the, in the alley in that little western town. And, and they pulled his body and it ripped and tore. And they finally got it out and brought it to the surface. And they brought him to the surface and they flew the body back to Fresno. And I was there when they brought him back years after he had first come to the altar. And now he was, he, he was a grown young man in his early 20s and they brought him in to the funeral home. I happened to come in. I didn't know all this was happening. I happened to come into Fresno, and I called Brother Morton. He said, well, he said would you go to the, uh, down to the mortuary with me? He said, I've got to check on some things. He said, there's a boy out of our church that died, and, and uh, his funeral is going to be tomorrow morning. And so as we went, I said, what's the deal on this boy? I didn't even know it was Steve. And he told the whole story. I said, well, what you don't know, Vaughn, is that boy came to the altar for the first time in revival that I preached out here in this little country town. And um, when we got there, they, they wouldn't open the casket. They said, well, there'll be no open casket. They just put the picture on top. They said, the body has been in the water a long time, and he's so mangled up, and, and uh, we don't even want anybody to see him. And uh, the next morning, Brother Morton went there. It was a beautiful home. We went to where uh, the parents were and did our best to comfort them and, and, and all, of, all of those things. And, and uh, the next morning, Brother Morton went and preached the funeral. Steve really did have tremendous ability. But because he did not learn the basic lessons that the way of the transgressor is hard, somehow, somehow, that boy got caught up and he never lived long enough for his life to come to fruition. How many stories could I tell you tonight that I know about? How many people have I preached their funerals or been to their funerals even while the revival was going on where I was preaching or in the church where I was pastoring? 
And how much longer of the drug addict that called me in the middle of the night that was raised in Pentecost uh, and sobbing and weeping says, Brother Wilson, would you help me? Uh, would you help me? I need help. And he's on the phone weeping for, for, and then silence for minutes as he would weep. Are you by yourself? No, Brother Wilson, I'm sitting in a room. There's some other people here stoned out of his mind. And uh, yes, we preached his funeral. And, and, uh, and on and on the list goes. The guy that wanted to call us out and fight us in the park one day. So ridiculous. And, and uh, until finally uh, we preached his funeral. And, and the gal that backslid that was so good looking but so full of bitterness. So full of bitterness that you could not mention church to her without her all of her beauty souring up. And, and, uh, and that's the girl that was in the lake that, they, that her sister told me that when she went down uh, the first time, she came back up. She was sunbathing, uh, tanning her beautiful body on a, on a little rubber raft uh, and, uh, and uh, fell off the raft and came back up and then went down and came back up and came up the third time. And finally, the third time when she came up, her sister told me that she screamed said, my God, I'm a backslider. God, if you give me one more chance. And she went down. And she never came back up. And I, I preached her funeral. I'm not talking to you tonight. I don't care if you think I'm trying to scare you or not. I hope to God you get scared. Because I'm talking about people that I preached their funerals. I'm talking about people that I watched in this life. I'm talking about what I know about the way of the transgressor. I'm preaching tonight things that I know what I'm talking about. And while you sit there and try to to twiddle your fingers and make yourself think of things that are not as, as heavy and sober as what I'm preaching about. Let me tell you that God is talking to you tonight about the condition of your soul and about the future of your destiny and about eternity. And you're forever somewhere. And if somewhere you don't get a hold of that rebellion, that resentment and that independence uh, against the Spirit of God and break it on an altar and say, God, I give you everything, uh, you will discover too late how hard the way of the transgressor really